Good morning and welcome to the Open Group Summit, Edinburgh 2024. Great to be back here. Uh, we were last here 18 months ago. <clears throat> and uh, I know many of the people who'll be this, here this week were with us then. And we got great feedback about venue, location, and everything else. And um, so we thought we'd come back. So um, uh, hopefully you'll have a great few days here, or a day if you're just here for one day. Um, but uh, it's uh, going to be a, a full week. Um, lots of, there'll be a lot more people around tomorrow as well. Um, part of the idea of the summits is to bring in as many of the open group forums and work groups as we can. Um, so that they get a chance to, uh, to mingle and um, uh, spark ideas off each other, etc. So um, you'll see some of that happening tomorrow. There'll be quite a big group from our OSDU forum uh, who start most of their activities tomorrow, although there are some going on today. So uh, expect it to be uh, a lot busier there. So make, make the most of the space today. Um, what other announcements? A very important thing for something like this, um, especially nowadays, post-COVID, as we all know in our daily lives, um, everything's expensive. And uh, everything's gone up a lot in price. And putting on an event like this at a location like this is not, would not be possible without the help of sponsors. And we have a nice, uh, healthy group of sponsors for this event. Um, AWS, Lean IX, S&P Global, uh, SLB and ThoughtWorks. So thank you very much to our sponsors. I'll say that again at some other point, but uh, uh, it is great that you are sponsoring us. And we also have some exhibitors, and I encourage you to take the opportunity to, exhibit, uh, to visit their exhibits um, when you can in the breaks. And that's the Association of Enterprise Architects, Icon Science, INT, Catalyst, and Petrolink. So some of them are still setting up. Some of them will, um, are already there, but uh, do please uh, make them feel like they were glad they came here. Um, so that's it for the, the sponsorship side. Um, before we get going and um, properly, uh, those of you who've seen the loop may have, may have seen this slide. Um, I can't let the first gathering of the Open Group clan go without uh, mentioning um, just a, a thank you to this gentleman, um, Bob Weissman, a very long-standing member and contributor to the Open Group. Uh, he unfortunately passed away recently, and um, otherwise I'm pretty sure he'd have been here. Um, and our thoughts are with him and his family um, right now. And uh, we do have I think something on our, I think it's on our architecture forum site where he, Bob was most active, um, where uh, people can uh, see a, a memorial to Bob. Um, so um, thank you, Bob Weissman. Um, so next thing, um, we value your input. As I say, one of the reasons we're back here is because we got great feedback last time around from being here. and. Uh, we, we have a small survey, that's the QR code for it, you'll see it at other times as well, I'm sure. Just a small number of questions, I promise. I think it's three questions, three multiple choice questions, and then an opportunity to tell us what you really think in the text question, an open-ended text question. So do please do that if we, we do uh, like the feedback, um, and we do use the feedback, we take note of it. Um, some housekeeping items. The, Breaks will be outside. Um, the lunch area uh, probably won't be a problem today, but we can seat 200 in the break area for lunch. Um, tomorrow and other days, we will have um, at least double that number. So um, uh, some, I, I, hopefully, we can encourage people to eat and then uh, make the tables available. We'll, we'll manage it all, and hopefully it won't be a problem to you. But do uh, realize that that's the main seating area for lunch. Um, it's just out here and, and to the right. Some of you were uh, already finding it today, I know. Um, and last, really, announcement before we get going. Um, we do have uh, an off-site event this evening um, at, the, at Edinburgh Castle, um, something, again, we did 18 months ago and was very well received. Now. 
We are sold out for the event. So if you haven't registered, um, we are full. It's not too late to express interest, but there is a waiting list. But my reason for mentioning it now is if any of you are signed up and have a spot and something's come up or you've changed your mind and you can't go, please let our folks on the registration desk know because there is a waiting list of people who are keen to go. Um, we do have the, uh, the castle rented out and uh, the opportunity to see the Scottish Crown Jewels and uh, have a nice dinner with some great um, local music. So um, please do, if you, if you can't make it, then uh, let us know. And those of you who are going, please, we're going to, the buses are going to leave from the Sheraton Hotel, the Sheraton um, Grand Hotel and Spa, which is a very short walk from here. The level zero, um, the back lobby, where the car park is, that's where the buses will, will um, be for you to board. And please be there 6.15 latest to get the bus up to the castle. Um, it is walkable, but um, it's uphill, so um, many people might walk back. Possibly, but um, but it is a it is a uh, it will be a great uh, a great evening, I'm sure. But 6:15 latest, please, to get the bus, so that we're all on time. Um, and that is it for the announcements for now, at least. Um, again, one more. I may as well say it. I'll say it tomorrow as well. But but um, today, um, I want to tell you we've got an an, an annual award that we do called the President's Awards, where we acknowledge uh, an individual and an organization, two awards, um, who have made significant contributions to the Open Group, and we uh, pick one of those. So we are announcing those at the networking reception tomorrow evening. So please look out for that and uh, be there to see who wins. So um, one more thing. It's not on my list, but I remembered we need to do it. We have, uh, those of you who've been around the Open Group a while or attended Toolkit Tuesdays or any of these things will have heard of the portfolio of digital open standards. It's something that we've been working on for a little while now, the goal of which is to make our standards easier to access and use together, cross-linking and uh, all sorts of cool stuff like that. Now, we have a new um, update to that which we are releasing this week or making available this week. And you'll hear more about that for those who want to from um, uh, Sonia Gonzalez, who will be presenting on that um, tomorrow, I think, in the track. So, but uh, it is worth checking out, and you'll hear more about it. And if, if it's of interest to you, ask somebody from the open group, ask somebody at the registration desk, and they'll link you up with, with Sonia, who'll be very happy to tell you more. So, without further ado, um, we have... Um, the first session today we have dedicated to, supposed to be moving this, aren't it? Ecosystems, architecture, and AI. So um, back in, I think it was October last year, we were happy to publish a book that, um, well, actually, not these gentlemen, two of these gentlemen, not me, um, but uh, the third gentleman you'll see this morning, Rahul, um, wrote and uh, together with uh, someone else called Neil Fishman. And it was about ecosystems architecture. And it was very well received, caused a lot of excitement and interest. And what does that mean? Well, you're going to hear more about what it means um, and what their plans are. And specifically, in keeping with the theme uh, of this event, you're going to hear about where AI may play a role in that. And then you'll hear a little bit more from myself and my colleague, Chris Ford, um, on uh, open group plans in this area. So um, that's what we're going to do between now and the morning break. So um, to introduce our speakers, um, first, Phil Tetlow is the CTO Data Ecosystems IBM UK. And for the past 21 years, Phil has worked as a technical architect uh, where he helps top 100 companies build really big data and anal uh, analytics IT systems. He has over 30 years of experience in the IT industry and has worked on a number of challenging client-facing projects. 
He specializes in the application of web-based technologies, metadata, and transformation techniques at enterprise level. So welcome, Phil. Pleasure, That's Steve. a lot of words, isn't it? It always sounds better when somebody else says it. Uh, also joining Phil so that I don't have to get up again and, uh, and interrupt the flow is uh, Paul Homan, distinguished engineer. Many of you will know Paul, um, CTO. He's currently the CTO f industrial for IBM Consulting, and uh, which basically covers automotive, aerospace and defense, oil and gas, electronics, industrial products and construction industries, and anywhere you bas basically anywhere you find engineering. Uh, he's a practice CIO advisor and passionate enterprise architect with substantial end user experience and knowledge, having worked as chief architect in the UK Post Office and Royal Mail, establishing EA practices and then living with the results. Welcome, Paul. And also joining, uh, joining Phil and Paul <coughs> is Rahul, who is um, a senior research engineer for the Emerging Technology Lab at Honda Research and Development Europe, UK. Welcome, Rahul. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rahul primarily focuses on deep tech strategy, data privacy, and decentralized architecture research for next generation systems and services. He's also a co-author of the Ecosystems Architecture, New Thinking for Practitioners in the Age of AI. So let's wake everyone up with a warm welcome for these three gentlemen. So. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here again. Um, it's nice to look out into the audience and see some, some old friends. Uh, we had some slides for this morning, um, but when we get together as a group, we, we, we like riffing. So this is as close to um, a jazz trio as you're ever going to get. So I thought what we would do this morning was essentially revisit the ideas of ecosystem archit ecosystems architecture, explain why we became interested and why we presented the challenges that we did to the international architecture community. Then we'll arc out a bit and look at current state of the nation. Uh, and then eventually we're going to come together. So we've been talking uh, with the open group now for, as Steve said, uh, about six months about state of the nation, where we are with regards to technology, where we are with regards to the aspiration of the global architect community and what that means for an international global organization who are genuinely um, open and objective. So, it's all right with you two gentlemen? Good, yeah. Right. Back on. So while Paul's pouring the water, should we start with once upon a time? That's always the, that's always a, the best way to start. So I'll, certainly Paul and I uh, were very lucky. I, I, I'm going to start with a bit of personal history. Um, we both knew a gentleman called Ian Charters. And in our professional world, to us, Ian Charters was the guy who, dare we say it, invented enterprise architecture. He was a lovely man. Uh, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But Paul and I used to meet with him frequently and talk about what the difference was between systems architecture and why do we need to worry about gluing systems together to create coherent organizations, enterprises, what does it mean? And um, interject, Paul, at any time. Yeah, but make well, sure. I, I often used to say to Ian, this enterprise thing, uh, I'm not too sure about it. And he said, why, Phil, why? Uh, and so at that time, I was off doing some work with the web guys, with the W3C guys. And um, I was personally worried about the way that the world was becoming increasingly networked and how it made no difference where you were globally in the world and how society was morphing around that. Uh, so I presented the, the, the position to Ian like this. So I said, if you were to look at the internals of most serious organizations, we might choose to call those enterprises, then the idea of enterprise implies some form of closure. It's all, you know, you're treating the problem space or uh, problem or the solution space that we're supposed to be working in as if it's a closed box. Most organizations today have got links, interfaces out into, across the internet and out into the worldwide webby type thing. So um, you ask any enterprise architect where the actual bounds of their organization is, and they probably won't be able to tell you. And not only that, what, what you're finding is because, the very, because of the very nature of the openness of the internet and the World Wide Web, the endpoints that organizations are interacting with are genuinely 
evolving. Uh, there's a whole strata of dynamics and, and change that's taking place that actually works against the foundational principles of architecture and control and engineering and so on and so forth. How do we handle that change? How do we handle that increase in complexity, increase in scale? And Ian's reply very sensibly was, don't look at me, I just do the enterprise architecture stuff. Um, there's a career for it, if you like, for you in that, if you like, Phil, so. I went off and I spoke to better people like Paul, and Paul said, I think there's a bit of an idea in that, and that's where we got started. Um, so, first thing we did was go and consult with people who should know better. And the interesting point is when you start to use words like evolution or change or dynamics and start to think about ideas like self-organization and large networks and um, you ask the question, what does that mean? Then most engineers will leave the room. But if you go and talk to the, the scientists, especially the natural scientists, they'll go, well, we've done this for years, we've done this for centuries. Actually, what you're looking for, and the word that most of them used was in situations like that where you've got very complex networks of interaction, we would use the word ecosystem. So that's where um, ecosystems architecture came from. That's the word that uh, we chose. Initially, uh, so Paul and I are from IBM, we did some work inside IBM. We eventually got to the point where, truth be told, we had too much interest inside our organization. And we were finding that we were getting various cliques of experts, individuals coming to us and saying, we're really interested in specialized patterns. How, how would we apply this to financial services? How would we, would we apply it to retail? And what we said was, mm, we're not really at that level yet. There are some base principles we need to work out. Uh, and actually, we need a little bit more room to uh, maneuver. So we moved the work out of a single organization, a single corporate, and we brought it to the open group. And it was probably the best thing that we ever did. It was at that point that we started to um, interact and interface with uh, organizations who were facing the same problem. You know, we've got some very, very big, very complex IT systems that today we're having trouble just getting them to talk to each other. And the reason for that is that there are multiple degrees of dependency that are opaque, transparent, or invisible to us. How do we face off against all those secondary challenges? And that's where we came across guys like Rahul. Um, and that's, so Steve, Steve Nichols is in the audience. Steve is from Rolls-Royce. Um, no. Sorry? DXE. DXE. Sorry, Steve. And um, same thing, how do we handle this? Uh, so we came together, we got a body, uh, a, a body of acknowledgement, a body of agreement, and then eventually we produced this most excellent book that I would recommend that you go out and buy. It's available in all major bookshops um, and Amazon online. Uh, if you were to twist the arm of the open group representatives today, I think you might be able to buy it at a significant discounted price, but I'm not allowed to comment on that. Nevertheless, that's where we are. Um, do you want to comment a bit more on history or about how we've yeah. met? Guys? Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, just to jump in. So, in terms of the, the, the theory history as well, and then to give a slightly personal uh, reason as to why this was worth, kind of, for me, thinking about, um, it, well, it, the provenance of it came about really because a long time ago, actually now, somebody said, uh, oh yeah, next year the three biggest terms are going to be X, Y, and Z, and one of them was ecosystems. And I kind of heard this word and I thought, fine, you know, ecosystems, and it, it sounds like a nice little buzzword, right? And, and um, true enough, everybody started talking about ecosystems the following year. We had, you know, business ecosystem, partner ecosystems, we had ecosystems, you know, you have to ecosystems partners. People suddenly had ecosystem appear in their job title um, or job description, and it was everywhere. Um, and then, soon after that, I was spotting popping up articles by quite important publications. You know, I, I was reading it in HBR and, and, and you know, MIT briefings and whatever about it's essential as an organization that you are part of an ecosystem. And, and all these things were coming about. Um, but what was really interesting to me and I would say, as an architect, and I, you know, I don't say that flippantly because it kind of I'm like a Blackpool Rock. If you break me in half, I still think it says Enterprise Architect inside. Whatever else Steve read out about my description, that's the kind of bit that's rippled through me in, in any, uh, permanently. Um, for me, the big challenge was, okay, 
So it, lots of people are saying it's important. People are talking about it as if it's something different. I'm not sure yet, because the other thing I've learned as an enterprise architect is a lot of things that come up as a label are just something that was there before, just relabeled. Um, but, you know, and so what, right? Can, can you actually prepare for this? Can you actually design it? Can you implement it? Can you do, is there such a thing as an architecture of an ecosystem and can you therefore architect it? Um, it's all right saying it's a thing and it's important, but actually people weren't really talking about how, right? And that was the, uh, the thing, and that was where we did, I'm gonna say, at the time, a lot of research um, inside uh, you know, the academy, inside IBM. We did a lot of research in terms of, is anybody actually doing stuff in this? And there were pockets where people were referencing and little snippets, and there was like the um, uh, Society 5 stuff, I think was one of the uh, uh, things that we saw. But um, the, the, the truth was, there seemed to us to be this gap that was worth exploring that said, actually, if this thing is important to people and people are saying it's important, then should we be doing something? And then a lovely bit of serendipity, and this is what I'm gonna kind of um, bring Rahul in, is there was a little bit of work that we were doing. Um, and, um, well, I'll leave you to describe the business situation, if yeah. that's okay. Um, and as soon as I saw it, and a, a colleague of ours, Sharm, who's, who's since left, but we're still both in touch with, a um, dear friend of ours, he, he basically kind of spotted and, and went, do you know that thing you're talking about, Paul, and the, thing, the problem you're looking at, Rahul, you should talk. And that's where we kind of kicked yeah. off, so I don't know if you want to give that a little bit. Thanks a lot, Paul. So, during the history of business, every company that designs a product or service, they consider themselves to be at the center of customer's universe. All they think about is how customer would use their own product. Honda is the same, IBM the same. But if you look at, from customer's perspective, they interact with hundreds of products during their lifestyle. So really, one company is really the center of customer's universe. And when we flip over that perspective, the way the architecture that needs to be designed should keep customer at the center. And that really happens in the current enterprise architecture design at all. Customer are there to product, to buy the product and services, but they are afterthought of how the customer-centered experience and design should be done for enterprise architecture. The main pivot came when we started talking about how to move from enterprise architecture to a customer-centered architecture where many, many products, many, many services are required by customer throughout the, a day, basically. How do you make it seamless? How do you make it easy? How do you make it more uh, adaptable to customer's lifestyle? And that is what we started discussing with uh, Paul's as part of our research right now. Yeah, so um, I've, I've just been sat here thinking about how we would move the discussion on, and a, a, a thought occurred to me. So we're introducing some relatively new terms to um, the architect community. The first one is ecosystem. Um, I'm going to introduce a term next, but I'm going to play a bit of a game. because I think we should talk about the challenges of ecosystems architecture uh, uh, specifically. So um, there are two characteristics that are right at the core of actually, not just ecosystems architecture, but the whole arc of technical advance. So as a community, it doesn't matter whether we're, as, as engineers, actually as scientists as well, we aspire to build bigger, better, stronger. Yeah. And, and the way that that manifests is essentially in the scale of the systems and the complexity of the systems that we aspire to design and build. There are some problems with scale and complexity in that um, as we scale out, complexity increases. However, the human brain has been, was originally, originally evolved to hunt animals on the plane. But we're now in a, a situation where we're being asked as individuals to face, against, face off against problems that are just beyond our cognitive capability as a species. So there's a game when, when the likes of Paul, I, and Rahul go out and lecture on this stuff. So we, we, we play the following game, which is, can somebody in the audience give, um, give me or give us 
a, a, a measure, a unit of measure for length. Does anybody want to put their hand up or should we? So an answer might be centimetres or metres or feet or whatever. A unit of measure for capacitance, coulombs, a unit of measure for resistance, ohms, whatever. The list could go on. Then the trick question is, could somebody give me a unit of measure for complexity? And the answer is that there isn't one. So um, a colleague of ours, again, a guy called uh, Morris Wilkes, came up with the idea of a headful. So, and what he meant by that was, if a problem is truly complex, then it can't fit inside a single head. How many headfuls do we need to actually solve this problem? So um, that's where we got to. Um, do you want to talk about headfuls and how we might, the ideas that we had about how we might manage that type of thing and, and where we are within the industry? There's another word I'm going to follow on with shortly. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll pick up from where, where that is. So, and some of you will have already heard about ecosystems, the work we started off, and the idea of the headfuls part. Um, and and uh, to be fair, one of the things that we did when we first brought or, or mooted the idea of, we think there's something in this, um, you know, we got a lot of uh, appropriate questioning about, well, is it something novel? Right? That was, a, that was a something we had to spend quite a few uh, clock cycles going around checking. Is it, is it actually uh, um, something, you know, and, and, so, and so what? What are you going to do about it? So we kind of went, okay, fine. Let's check. It, has this already been invented? Is it systems dynamics? Is it, is it enterprise architecture just renamed, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and there were a few different characteristics. So coming to the headfall part, the, the, a couple of the characteristics was one, um, and this comes back to the customer centricity point that Rahul made is, uh, and I think I've said it before, but wait, well, no, I have. <laughs> so when, whenever we draw any kind of architectural map or model, which is how we try and reduce a headful into something that we can look at and visualize, we always draw our area of concern in the middle of the page, whether that's us us as a country, if you look at a map, whether it's uh, the main system of concern, whatever it is, you know, we draw the, the main focus in the middle and everything out from there. And one of the golden rules that we found as a kind of, as a, as a, a handle to hold on to, if you like, as you're sort of ascending the, the stairway to kind of think about this, is in ecosystems, if you draw yourself into the center, you've instantly failed. Yeah. So you can't draw your own organization in the center. Now that may sound incredibly simple and a bit daft in some ways, but I can assure you the working group, and luckily the working group members were nodding, or members that I can see, you know, when you practice that and you try it out, you realize just how important it is to try and shift your thinking. And so in a lot of ways, this was really about how do you think differently and what are some of those different thought constructs that come into, come into play. And, and the problem was, it didn't take us very long till we realized that the problem with uh, digital ecosystems or, 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 or virtual ecosystems or whatever you want to call them is, unlike a physical one, you can exist in more than one at the same time. And you will exist in more than one at the same time in different classes, different types of ecosystem, different physical implementations of ecosystems. That suddenly blew our minds because that was way more than a head fall. In that, just that one idea. And we mm -hmm. and then, so com start and combine these ideas, you're kind of going, this is getting really, really complex. So our target state, really important to us, very important to me, and I'll keep going on about this, and I'm, I'm the boring one in the group, says, we're here about ecosystems. That's why we're trying to, that's what our working group is focused on. Um, and we realized quite early on, with a lovely bit of serendipity, that actually one of the ways of helping us um, attenuate all that information, and, and that's actually an ecosystem uh, characteristic that we've been talking about, uh, and being able to amplify back out to be appropriate to the ecosystem, it, uh, one of the, the things in there is tooling. And AI is an, has, has, has demonstrated to us as, a, as a, um, a very important part of the tooling to get to the target of ecosystems which is why we spent a lot of time looking at AI. So, I'll take that forward, Paul. Uh, we started with enterprise architecture when the whole world was centralized. We could have a platform run and owned by a brand or a company and be done with it. 
but the way the world is moving forward, the centralization is getting weaker and weaker because of scaling, for example. More importantly, the number of devices, the number of products a customer has in their own life is exponentially increasing now. We have connected device everywhere in the house, in the office, uh, cars, phones, everything is connected right now. How do you design a architecture which takes care of these things? Is it hybrid architecture? Is it centralized, reaching the limits of its uh, uh, capability right now? And this is where we take the idea forward and said, we need to think differently. <coughs> it is not possible for a group of people to sit in a room and design enterprise architecture, which took us to the tooling challenge. And serendipity was that AI came at the right time for us when we were busy discussing how to handle the question of complexity and how to solve the design problem now at the scale of ecosystem architecture. So serendipity was going to be my next word. Oh, sorry. But, so that's good. That's good. <laughs> There's a word that, that actually nicely twins with serendipity. Yeah. So the word, the word I've got, the, you, you guys know I like to use this a lot. So the word that I use is confluence. Confluence, yeah. So I've, I've got written here, there's, a, there's another phrase I really wanted to use, which was, so here's the thing, <laughs> right? There's no such thing as coincidence, really. No. So we're living in, to my mind, a rather unprecedented age. If you look at the speed at which we're seeing advance, and I'm loosely going to say in the area of software, right? but actually that, you can squeeze that down a bit. And it, so there are multiple, I'd never use, like using the term AI because it means different things to different people. But certainly in the area now that we're, where most people are talking about generative AI or large language models. Uh, so multiple layers of neural networks, one stacked on top of the other with some very, very fine-grained, integrate, in, intricate detail around how you store and represent information. That field is exploding to the point where it's becoming profound and almost worrying. Now, just to go back to the point about a head full, if you, the flip side of that coin is if we humanly can't face off against a problem, there are only really two other ways that we can try to absorb the detail that we need. The first one is, and we've done this again in, in science and engineering for centuries, is typically rather than moving towards focusing in on a problem, what we've got, the, we've got this word abstract. You essentially move back to the point where the, the detail becomes less important and you can actually see the full picture. The problem with scaling complexity is you can't simplify complexity to handle it properly which means that abstracting is probably no longer good enough. And that leads to the, the only other conclusion, which is if we as human architects can't face off against the challenges that we're aspiring to tackle, then the word, the, the, the phraseology that I, that I use is that, in fact, this is the conclusion we came to before this generative explosion. We're going to need synthetic assistance. Now, when we talk about synthetic assistance as architects, we, that's where we move into the domain of tooling. And, and it's interesting because essentially what we used to do as IT architects, as Paul said, we typically would, would work out problems in two dimensions. We'd like drawing pictures on, on, on paper. So boxes and lines. And typically we would put the primary point of focus in the middle of the page, that's no longer good enough because we're dealing with multiple network points within a network and you may never actually know where you actually are within that network. Yeah. But actually the number of dimensions or facets associated with the type of problems that we're facing off against, had, it's beyond exponential, it's an explosion of detail and um, capability that we need to absorb. At the same time, this generative AI movement came along. And uh, what's fascinating about that was, I, so I personally see uh, generative AI as being a major tipping point in the industry. And I, I'm going to be slightly provocative and heretical here. So for the computer scientists in the room, most of you most probably know about the Turing test. About if, you know, if I can talk to a machine and believe that it's human, you pass the Turing test. Well, today, no, let's do it the other way. Let's flip the coin again. Prior to the current era that we're in, we had to train, we had to train really hard to understand 
how to converse in languages that machines could understand. And as a, as a common denominator, we would refer to that as being programming. Today, it's the exact opposite. Machines can talk to us using our mother tongue. And what's interesting is that not only can machines talk to us using our tongue, be that French, Japanese, Chinese, Ethiopian, Mongolian, or English, who cares? They can actually talk to us in any language that they've had significant experience of, which means any programming language, so you can present code to these things, any specification language, so you, you can talk to them in VDM, Z, or any other formal language, any strongly semantic language, so I did some work on languages like RDF and OWL, most of the good LLMs can, can, can converse in all of those in multiple more languages. And in fact, they can make their own languages up on the fly. So you can converse with them in either at meta level or meta meta level, if you so wish. What that does is it increases the capability and reach of our tooling to a point that we have never experienced before in the industry. That's extremely profound. So I'm just going to lay it out there because I know you two guys will overlay on top of that and add some genuine insight. So, well, and, and I'll, so let me take it back to ecosystems, because and I will keep doing that. Yeah, yeah, so of course. Yeah. Granted, and I'll keep to say it, it's the, the boring one in the group. Um, so for me, one of the things that, uh, and, and as I say, when we when we first muted the idea around ecosystems, a lot of challenge. You know, is this just one and the same thing, or is it different? Actually, not only was AI a way for us to say, mm, this is going to help us address some of the problems that we are uh, exposing in our investigations through architecture, architecting ecosystems, it is actually also exacerbating the problem. So it's actually creating the problem as well. So that's, it's, it, and that realization came as a result of the investigation. And what, and what I mean by that is, if, if I oversimplify and go back, if I wanted to create an enterprise that didn't exist, I would, you know, recruit some people. I, 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 you know, maybe build offices, whatever. I could, I could physically set up an enterprise, right? Um, and it would look a bit like an organisation with people, and I'd adopt processes and, and whatever else. And you can see that, and therefore, um, I can think about what the architecture is in advance, and then I can, and, and you know, kind of go about uh, doing that. And if um, so, being able to kind of initiate it. Um, if I didn't do any of that. And, and I'm not an entrepreneurial CEO, so it's never going to happen. But if I didn't do any of that, enterprise wouldn't come about. Right? It just doesn't suddenly spontaneously appear. Ecosystems, however, with the advent especially of the kind of uh, ability for, for the uh, repeated provenance of information, the di distribution that you talk about, um, and some of the AI capabilities that you throw in there, happen uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the word accidentally, if you like, but that's not really the correct word. But they happen without necessarily direct control. Nobody sits there, you know, for you every ecosystem. Almost so spontaneously. Almost. Yes. Yeah. But, but the, the, <laughs> I could almost say that. But, uh, um, but the, the idea being that, yes, there are times when perhaps a number of organizations want to come together and deliberately set up, initiate some kind of ecosystem. And in my mind, I think of that as a, a kind of closed ecosystem, right? It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that it stays closed, but it's certainly quite deliberate. But actually, what we were seeing, when we were going out and pointing, and there's various tools and techniques in the book, by the way, where to, to kind of evaluate a, uh, an ecosystem to see whether or not it's missing any necessary ingredients. Um, one of the things that we did in there is say, OK, if I pointed at this, actually, is that is that become an ecosystem because of, uh, uh, you know, you know, by accident, spontaneously. And, and that actually means that suddenly you're, you're faced with a different challenge. You're not just faced with the fact that it only exists if you deliberately design it or deliberately build it. It can happen anyway. So a number of organizations suddenly start interacting, and they could be entity parties, customers, you know, suppliers, whatever else. You could become completely disintermediated in the digital world using AI accidentally, without even realizing. And that, that was an important part of the whole piece. It isn't just by deliberate design that changes it. So. And one of, the, one of the major factors which made that happen was the emergence of platform economy. Everybody 
which is a major brand, today has its own platform. Uh, Apple, Google, Amazon, even otherwise retail uh, sector, everything is built upon a platform. But one of the key realization which is happening today is the current model of ecosystem, which is mostly controlled by one major brand at a time, is also reaching its limit. You can't really control the way a platform wants to behave. And the main challenge is, at certain point in time, at certain limit of growth, the value of that ecosystem starts to slow down. And then when the customers, the business, the, the participants are looking for more, more value, it will not come from that controlled, closed, centralized ecosystem. And then you have to step out and see what's out there, what are the collaborations, what other joint uh, efforts do we need to make. And that's where we are going towards from centralized ecosystem to decentralized ecosystem in a way. So we had all of these thoughts bouncing between us as a team. You're actually looking at the part of the core group here, but um, truth be told, there were m many people who were contributing towards the ideas. And we tried various methods to lay down our thinking. We certainly, I can remember trying to write a couple of white papers and thinking, uh, we're not going to fit all this in one space. So essentially what we did was we thought, we approached the open group and said, is there any chance we could write a book? And graciously, the open group said yes. So this book, the Ecosystems Architecture book that Steve kindly reminded everybody came out last year was essentially, what you got here is a collection of thoughts that were amassed over probably 15 years, probably about 15 years worth of thinking. But um, that's what you get with this. You essentially get the ground zero representation of what we genuinely believe is going to be the next grand challenge in IT architecture. But that's not, this isn't enough. Um, so it's one thing to have a grand idea, it's one thing to put some sensible thoughts in, in one place. And admittedly, in this book, you'll find um, some ideas that we practically worked through inside the team, so we know work, uh, work for real. But you know, as IT architects, we get paid for delivery, we get paid to do things for real. So um, we need evidence, we need proof that um, this is a real thing, that it is usable, that the ideas, and ultimately what needs to drop out of this are methods and methodologies. I'll put it in a different way, actually. Yep. I, I think we have identified a potential pain point, a big challenge for enterprises today. What we want to do is to hear that other companies, other organizations, other enterprise architects have also hit that particular pain point. They may not know how to verbalize it. This is where the book comes in handy. Please read it. You'll find certain mental models which are new, newish. And hopefully that will help you to recognize that the pain that you had been feeling all these years in getting your in, uh, enterprise architecture done is because we need to step up from enterprise architecture into ecosystem architecture. Yeah, so as you might have guessed, we're passionate about this stuff. We really care about how we do it properly. The point I was trying to make was that transitioning from a position of good thought to a position of good principle and good practice in itself needs some thinking. Yeah. And over the past year, we as a group, and actually as an extended group, because we've been talking about this to other, other members inside the open group, have been thinking about that transition. How do we move into a very pragmatic, practical arena? And there are some ideas that have fallen out that I'd like to bring to the table. So we've had a, a reasonable amount of tension internally about what's our working group about, how do we keep it clean, how do we keep it concise, how do we make sure that uh, quite rightly and professionally appropriately we do not interfere with other good work that's going on inside the open group and actually inside a number of other professional bodies. And to do that, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to give a list of three areas as a takeaway from this session, if I may, um, and then we can briefly deb debate those amongst us. So, uh, three T's. So, as the Ecosystems Architecture Group, here's the first T. We are predominantly interested in target. We're predominantly interested in the challenges, the problem 
of building IT architectures above enterprise level. So hyper enterprise architecture, context, challenges, and all the other gubbins that comes with that. That's us. Are you happy with that, Paul? Yeah. Right. There's a challenge there because inherent in that target space is the need for synthetic assistance. There is a need to be able to aug augment tradition, uh, traditional architectural skill to the point where we can burst out into a, an arena that we're not used to and we should be uncomfortable in because of the scale and complexity parameters. That's about tooling, that's the second T. Now we're acutely aware that there are other groups inside the open group like the AI forum who are focusing down more on the specifics of AI and specifically tooling. So apart from anything else, we've got the guys who are off building tooling specifically inside the open group. We do not explicitly want to tamper with any of that work, but at the same time there is a cross-cutting element and we're aware of that. So that nets out into we're more than comfortable having that discussion with you. And then the final T, actually, um, it started off as a P, so I'll give you the P first, is professional practice. But to make this comfortable to get a list of T, um, how about calling that trade? Right, so the three T's are target, trade craft. Trade craft. Trade craft. Yeah, there you go. That's why we bring you to <laughs> conferences like this, Rahul. So um, we had a slide in the deck this morning, and Rahul gave us the heading for it, which was the ecosystems architecture group is about target, not tools. Make that clear, Phil. So we've made that clear, hopefully. Thank you. Right. Let's just tease out a few of the elements with regards to trade craft or practice. Now, what we're actually seeing, so I'm going to pretend to be a historian for a second. Um, if you look at the arrival of any seismic, seminal technology, look at the printing press, look at the arrival of the automobile, look at the arrival of the internet, typically you find a sequence of activity. And I'm going to talk from a very, very... I was going to say a biased standpoint, but I'm just going to lay it out there. Um, and, and I'm going to tell this as a joke, but you'll get the point. Normally what happens is the lawyers smell the blood in the water first. They see an opportunity and they stand up and go, I think we should be doing something here. So typically what you will find is that legislation arrives first. Once the lawyers have stood up and made a noise, then the politicians start to get worried. That's why you normally get regulation after legislation. But actually what you will find, and I'm just laying it out there, is that really what happens that makes a difference when the rubber hits the road, when you're actually at ground zero, is that it's professional practice that makes the difference. It's the guilds, it's the professional associations that stand up. So I'm going to oversimplify things just to get the point out there. One might argue that if you look at legislation and regulation, their primary objective is to tell individuals and organizations what not to do. And who to trust. Yeah, and who to trust. Who, or, or who not to trust. Who not to trust. Right. Professional practice is the opposite. It's about telling you what you should do as well as what you shouldn't do. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that across the world we're seeing a lot of, I might actually say, good legislation and good regulatory behavior starting to emerge. But if you look across the piece with regards to professional practice or tradecraft, then at the moment, there's a relative void, a relative vacuum. There are some standards that have just started to emerge. We were talking yesterday evening, um, the US government is starting to make a lot of good noise about somebody somewhere needs to stand up. Um, should we just, do you want to pass comment? you guys and then with another piece that we're going to travel on to next. So what do you think about tradecraft or the three T's, Paul? So, so there's a, there was an epiphany moment. So I, I'll indulge me slightly because I'm going to kind of dive into why I think it's the, the, the last T or the P as it was. I love the way you phrased that. You're going to have to listen back to that, Phil. That was quite comic. Anyway, the, um, <laughs> uh, the, the epiphany moment for me, actually, um, the fourth main author, and as you say, there's plenty of people involved in the book, but the, the, the fourth name on the front, Neil. Um, Who will Bishop, be with us on Wednesday, by the way. At the workshop, when we're yep. doing the workshop on this, uh, one, and the tooling part in particular. Um, 
uh, made me realize perhaps actually why a lot of the, um, and I'm going to speak personally, uh, you know, if it echoes and resonates, great. If not, then, you know, fine, I'll stand alone. But a lot of the frustrations around uh, my experiences in enterprise architecture over the last quarter of a century or so um, have kind of not fallen short of, of my aspiration of what it could achieve, right? That's not to say that it doesn't work. In, in, you know, I wouldn't want to say that at all. I wouldn't keep doing it. But, um, you know, people always sort of say to me, oh, where's the, the perfect example, right? And you kind of go, yeah, and I can, I can give you pieces of examples. I can illustrate ex places where it's worked in time. Um, so it's got a temporal habit or part of an organization or particular efforts and focuses. But I can't show you something that's got a sustainable, long-term viable model that says this is, these, these people cracked it and they're just coasting now because it's all sorted. Right? It just doesn't seem to happen. And, and I always put that down to the flux of the environment. And there is an element of that, right? The environmental situation around anything changes and therefore the enterprise architecture therefore has to keep, and you know, it's hard to keep up with that and, and people change. But one of the things in the epiphany moment I that I referred to was, uh, was Neil kind of went, well, what do you mean by enterprise, right? Now, I, I, I've got to admit, I've sat and lost too many hours of my life debating individual terms. I, I notice I haven't said the word capability just yet. Um, but, you know, it, over the years. But um, what he was getting at and what was really, really important and what's relevant to this um, is the whole point about enterprise and enterprise architecture, when I look at it, is about having that common goal. So semi-autonomous units all aiming towards a common goal. Any large organization has more than one common goal, right? In fact, they often have goals in tension with one another. Um, you know, and that actually may say, is a complete truism. and may sound blooming obvious, but as soon as you realize that that actually competes with the way you set up, you may set up your enterprise architecture efforts. To me, it kind of went, oh, right, okay. I've some, and you know, maybe everyone else got that and I was the last to it. But I kind of went, oh, do you know what? That makes so much sense as to why this situation, it didn't work because there was competition in the way that, that things were, were incentivized, were motivated, were the, the, the place it dealt with. And what that really meant to me was, when I was looking at really large organizations, especially organizations that work with other parties, yeah. right? So, you know, if I take, uh, and, and forgive me, I'll speak and you correct me, but if I take a, a, an automotive um, OEM, not only have you got a supply chain, but, uh, but I'm being unfair because Honda is way more than an automotive OEM. Absolutely. There's plenty of other things Absolutely. that it does as well. And, you know, I'm sure at the very top, someone would like to say it's all cohesive and coordinated, but essentially, because you're dealing with different markets, different consumers, different other organizations, those are different enterprise goals. Yeah. And therefore, because they're in tension, the idea that you could somehow beautifully, seamlessly put all that in one place actually is a little bit of a false hope. It's an oversimplification. So what we've done is we've made it and turned it into a headful, solvable problem, yeah. but actually it's way more complex than that. We kind of know that, but what we've really got, even within a large organization like Honda, like IBM, like I would, you've got ecosystems, right? And that's, and that's the point. And I'll amplify the problem and challenge even more, actually. So a product or service successful if it meets the shared goal of the company with the customer. So customer has a goal, company has a goal, and if we can identify a shared goal, then we are creating something beautiful, something productive, something useful, okay? Now, let's forget about the enterprise side for a minute and think of the customer right now, okay? A customer has not a singular goal in the day. They have many, many goals all throughout their lifestyle, basically digital, physical world, whichever they, wherever they go. How would somebody design products and services and architecture to fulfill all the goals that a customer has in his day? Because each of that goal would overlap with a company or an organization or a platform or service. How do you architect for that shared goal lifestyle with the customer now? It's currently an impossible problem. 
And that's what brought us towards ecosystem architecture as a potential way to approach and solve, hopefully. And then just to kind of bring it back through, it, so that was why the, the target kind of became even more relevant and the, the trade, the professional practice of architecting it became challenged. Yeah. And then the tooling part in the middle helps with both of those. So there's a tooling part that says, I need tooling to be able to deal with this ecosystem construct. But actually, tooling is going to be highly relevant to my trade craft. Absolutely. And I have to be able to understand that, and I have to, to do it to A, help me, but also because that tooling is going to be used out within the ecosystem and create other entities which I need, that are going to be part of the architecture that I need to, to get on top of. So, so that double problem basically said to me, the, the trade craft of architecting, there are some fundamentals in there that, that ripple straight through, the viability, the validation, the, the option, you know, that kind of thinking. But actually, the need to be able to have trade craft that incorporates how AI challenges it and how I use it is reflected hugely in the ecosystem's work. And tradecraft is important because ultimately it's all about trust. Uh, in the traditional guilds and, and certification-based systems, you can uh, pretty much say a certified enterprise architect, you can, can have a higher degree of trust for the expertise, for the performance, for the output. One of the challenges right now, which again is part of our scope, but we are wondering how to work with the AI side right now is, that the AI systems right now themselves are not fully trustworthy. There is a lot of hallucination, for example, in LLMs as well. Yep, there's a lot, of, lot now, of challenges. As we are trying to combine AI with enterprise architecture or ecosystem architecture, there are newer risks and dangers which are coming about. How do you establish trust in these trade craft now? And that's kind of an emergent challenge which we have identified through ecosystem architecture approach now, where a conversation with our AI colleagues is becoming more relevant now. So let me try to explain where we are. And when I say when, where we are, I don't mean we, I mean we as a community. I think whether we like it or not, we're in a phase of early adoption in um, a post-generative AI era. Now, rather selfishly, um, we would like to introduce uh, a call to action, please, specifically in line with the objectives of the Ecosystems Architecture Working Group. So we've got a, 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 an increasing number of members, which is great. Clearly, we would like as many members as possible. We're getting early feedback with regards to early adoption. We're seeing or we're hearing stories like, um, I'm using the principles and I'm starting to adopt generative AI to allow me to do my job better. I'm using coding assistance for once now. Um, I'm using the thoughts that you've laid down and the new technologies to allow me to think differently, to allow me to step outside myself and QA the work that I've done. So, and all of that's kind of, we expected that, but it's only the start of an avalanche. So, We've been approached by some members who've said, do you think I could use the principles of ecosystems, architecture, and generative AI to actually extend or augment the methods that we use internally? What about methodologies? What about, can I actually get this thing to create my own standards? And this thing becomes recursive and mm. a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's a bit of a brave new world. Our call to action is not only would we like as many contributors as possible, we want as many contributions as possible. We'd like to understand from you where you are with regards to your thought processes, how you are accepting or rejecting the ideas of ecosystems architecture as originally laid down in the book, but actually also as internally discussed with inside our group. We want to hear as much argument, as much credit, we want to hear about your pain, your joy, your anxiety, and everything else. Reason being, we plan to lay that down in a, in a follow-on book at the very least. So um, this thing becomes 
in itself an evolving beast, which is exactly what it should be. Now, off the back of all of that, all of that stuff, um, I found myself calling Steve Nunn. Uh, the primary reason was because he forgot to send me a Christmas card. Again, he says, looking in Steve's direction. But Steve said to me, oh, Phil, 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 there's a whole lot of stuff going on. What should I do? And I said to him, well, first thing is, don't listen to me. Um, go off and make your own mind up. And I pointed him at some material to go and read, which thankfully he did. Uh, and since then, we've had a number of follow-up calls and a promise that I will be on his Christmas card next, list next year. Remember that, so I've got witnesses. Um, so, if I may, I'm going to invite you back on the stage, Steve, and then you can, you can introduce some wonderful and amazing things. Oh, about the trade yeah. We'll see about that. But, uh, no, thank you, gentlemen, for the, uh, laying, laying the groundwork and explaining, um, explaining what you've been doing and, um, and giving some thoughts as to what we might do. And I, I think... Um, Oh, I'm loud enough, that's good, I guess. Um, as you've made clear, um, we're all, a day doesn't go by without AI coming up um, in the news um, for good or bad. And uh, we're all kind of trying to puzzle out what are we gonna do with, with AI just in our everyday lives. Now, when it comes to an organization like the Open Group, um, there's bound to be a lot of interest and significant impact in what we do um, from this, this rise, particularly in the generative AI and the leaps that have uh, been made in that technology and availability of that technology. So we have to be thinking about what are we doing? And you mentioned there is some uh, activity going on. Um, I'm gonna correct you slightly. Um, Phil, it's not a, um, a AI forum, but that's just, uh, a, it's a AI work group within the architecture forum. So those, some of you in the room are participating in that, I think. And um, that group has been working. I'm not gonna say too much about that um, at, at this moment, but, because um, uh, I'm gonna invite somebody else to do that. Um, but uh, what, we know is that um, each of our forums and work groups and consortia are bound to be thinking about, and some already clearly are and have told us they are, how does AI impact them, their industries, uh, in the case of those who are more working more on vertical industries, how does it impact their operations within the open group? All of those things are things that we need to address and, and think across the whole piece. Um, one of the things you made clear was that you spent quite a bit of time thinking about AI as a group, you, you and the other members of the working group, uh, the ecosystems architecture working group, to differentiate it from the one I just mentioned. Um, you spent a lot of time thinking about it because you identified fairly early on, I think, that it was a path to um, a helpful part uh, of the tooling that you needed to get to your target of being able to do ecosystems architecture. A, a way of helping with the headful issue, you know, the more than the headful issue. So that's kind of, and I think we used the term either today or in our previous discussions, um, kind of a beachhead um, that you've got to and you want to work in that area. Um, we're gonna see that uh, in, in our other forums and work groups as well, I'm sure. Um, there is work underway, um, which, uh, in fact, now is as good a time as any. Chris, can I ask you to come up? You can even take my seat. Um, Chris Ford is the um, Vice President of Enterprise Architecture for the Open Group. Um, and Chris, you probably need a mic. If you, oh, you can maybe, use this maybe do that one. Um, perfect. I'll take my seat. Um, so, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about the current, not, the current activities of the AI work group within the Architecture Forum? Because that was, it's actually quite significant. Is this thing working? Okay, good. Um, so, concurrently, but a, in a little bit of a laggard, no, I shouldn't say laggard, that's a pejorative term, 
follow-on activity that occurred is, um, well, the folks on the ecosystems architecture work were moving towards the uh, development and the publication of the book. Um, within the architecture forum, some members came together in a very informal way and said, we think we have some materials that we need to uh, bring to the open group uh, with issues that our, um, our organizations or our customers are struggling with around this big thing related to uh, large language models and generative AI that's just dropped into, the, into the, their worlds over the past uh, couple of years. So we had some material donated that was honed in the architecture forum because it needed a home, not necessarily because that's the final uh, delivery point for all of the complexity that are in the issues that are related to this topic. But some, some areas that, the, uh, that that team, the AI working group within the architecture forum came up with is a, a list of topic areas of concern. So alignment with business goals, <coughs> resource allocation, risk management, competitive advantage, innovation and scalability, data governance and quality, implementation governance, talent development, ethical considerations, which is a topic you'll hear a lot about, success measurements, stakeholder alignment, technology and solution architecting. And out of that kind of initial interest set of areas, they came up with a list currently of 22 potential delivery areas None of that deals specifically with the target of ecosystems architecture, nor does it deal directly with uh, tradecraft or practice, professional practice. And in other areas uh, that we have um, architecture tooling in, the subject of AI application and in fact, entrepreneurial work that we are familiar with going on in the industry uh, is indicating that generative AI, using our standards, both TOGAF and Archimate, are out there in the wild being developed by entrepreneurs. So this is a very real situation for us. Tomorrow evening, there's a networking reception, uh, and uh, Dr. Chris Harding and Nikhil Kumar will be in a corner somewhere waving their hands saying, if you want to talk to those folks about what they're doing and you have an interest, you now have all of these authors who hopefully will be there, and you have the folks that I just mentioned, and it's an opportunity for you, not only today but tomorrow, to interact and communicate what it is you might be interested in seeing or participating in in terms of the open group. What capabilities do you need? What services do you need? What do you, as uh, these folks said, what problems and issues do you have? And how can we help facilitate some thought leadership and solutioning towards those problems? So that's kind of the summary, Steve. Great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so um, do, do remember tomorrow evening, if you're interested in hearing more about what that group is doing, then, then please go um, find them in the corner, and uh, we'll try and make them obvious. So thank you for that, Chris. Um, Really, I'm going to go back now to the conversations that, that Phil and I had, and Chris was involved in those as well, actually, in the, in the early stages and, and subsequently. And what was clear for, uh, I'm not personally a technologist with a technolo uh, technology background. So I was looking at things from the point of view of, OK, this is another technical um, wave, uh, multiple waves in this case. What is it that the Open Group and its members with their expertise and our staff with our expertise in facilitating those discussions and leading to things like the book and the various standards and white papers that we publish, what is it that we can do that's useful and isn't just, a, oh yeah, we're doing AI too? Because Everyone's going to be doing that if they're not already saying that. Um, we're not the only organization in the world that, that works on standards collectively, obviously. Um, and what that came back to, um, 
with Phil's cons um, considerable help on this identifying, was we've heard legislation is coming. I think I even heard you say good legislation, which some, is some two words I don't yeah, often yeah, yeah, see yeah. next yeah. to each other. But legislation is, is coming, and, um, and regulation will follow, um, certainly, and is already following. Uh, and that leaves the area of professional practice. And, hmm, what does the open group do? Well, we have a number of standards where we, um, th that we have created that help individuals in their professional practice, in their trade craft, however we want to call it. But, so we've been doing certification of, of people for some time now. We have a very large number of uh, individuals in the world who are certified, for example, under our TOGAF certification program, TOGAF certification for people program. Not just TOGAF. We have other knowledge-based programs, for example, the Archimate um, standard as well, and IT for IT and, and, and others, uh, OAA. But what we also have is something um, which I've been, uh, and our, I've, I've mentioned this to our governing board a number of times, we have a program called the Open Professions Program, which to me is um, a, a real diamond. It, it, is, it is a very valuable program and it is, it, it focuses on skills and experience based certification. Different to the knowledge based approach, learn a standard, take an exam, uh, and uh, that's, that's how you get that certification. This is more about what you've done in your career, and we've changed it in recent years to, to provide milestones that um, lead to a, to a certification rather than having a big bundle and looking backwards on your career. So you can work towards it now much easier. And we have um, very uh, well-respected standards for enterprise architecture, for technical specialists, for data scientists, that's the most recent one, and for trusted technology providers. So we've got that framework. Um, that looks at what does it mean to be a professional in these areas and some organizations <coughs> adopt those there are there are some in the room here whose representatives are, uh, I can see some organizations have adopted those as the basis of their internal programs for career progression and professional practice and so what I am saying here today I guess is um, that the area of professional practice not only is a gap when it comes to, to AI and those using AI, those, those um, architecting AI systems, we don't know exactly what the target is yet for this professional practice. It could be all of those, it could be some of those. But we are, as an organization, incredibly well placed, uh, building on our reputation and our past history. Uh, in the, particularly in the architecture world, we are very well placed to work on this. Um, and so we are going to be working on this. Um, we still have the, as I say, we still have detail to work out on what should the target be. And my approach would typically be where can we add the most value in the quickest time? Um, so find, find some low hanging fruit, if you like, as a, as a target for that. <laughs> and then perhaps build on that program. But professional practice is a gap, and we feel very well placed to, um, uh, to play in that space. And I'd encourage any members of the, uh, of the open group or anyone who isn't a member of the open group that is interested in that area to join us in uh, working in that space and filling that gap. And, Do you mind if uh, I just add a couple of words no, to assist? Please. So I don't know whether you realize it, this is a very, very important discussion. Uh, so when Steve and I started our conversation earlier in the year about this, thing's, this stuff's going on, what should we do about it? What I said to him was, the open group is the place to have this conversation uh, for two reasons. One, you are global, and secondly, you're independent. And actually, thirdly, you're the home of IT architecture, if you take the first two into consideration. 
So what I'm about to say next might sound a bit extreme, but I think there is one thing that all of us can agree on in this room instantaneously, which is AI is here, it's happening now, and above all else, the one thing that we need to maintain as sacrosanct is we need to be able to ensure that humans are all, always, full stop, always in the loop. So for me, this is a very, very clear point. Either IT architecture absorbs generative AI or whatever's coming next, or generative AI will absorb IT architecture. I think it's incumbent upon us as a profession to make sure that we, we, we hold solid and true professional practice right at the core of all of that. And it has to happen here. Well said, well said, Phil. And we'll, we'll hear more on, on that point. We will hear um, more this afternoon. We have a, a, a presentation from uh, uh, Barry Thompson, who's, who's uh, sitting over there, who will talk more about um, professional, uh, professional practice in that sense, and what it means to be a, a profession. And um, we're also, we, the Open Group, is, uh, we're, we're looking at what other organizations are working in this space that may be valuable to partner with. And um, we'll, hear, we'll hear more um, this afternoon from um, Dr. Florian Osman, who's with the Turing Institute uh, here in the UK, um, because they are working in, in vaguely in this area, not in the, necessarily in the professional practice space. But you'll probably see a, um, a, a collaboration um, a good collaboration between uh, various organizations. But for us, um, as uh, when Phil said this, it was, it was actually refreshing to have somebody play back to me the messages that I, that I give about the open group and professional practice and certification and, and all, of these, uh, all of these things and play it back as it's the, it is the obvious place for this to happen, Steve. Let's, let's make it so. So um, that's what that's what we intend to do, and um, there is going to be more um, more discussion on this. You're going to hear about this um, uh, fairly regularly from the open group, but also uh, immediately, uh, as I say, we've got more presentations this afternoon. But we also, gentlemen, can you say a few words about the the workshop that you're running on Wednesday morning? I think it is. Yes, Wednesday morning. Well, I, I'll let you give the final details on that one. But I'll just, uh, just ahead of that and kind of segue into it slightly. So the whole thing about the open group and just to kind of draw together something else for me that's relevant, another key dynamic on all of this and one of the main reasons why it was an obvious uh, place to home the whole work around mm -hmm. ecosystems architecture. Um, I'm sure Steve won't mind me. And if he does, he hasn't got a choice anyway. I, I'm just going to refer to him. You know, we have worked together in the same working group we're from what you could call competing organizations externally. That to me, and, it, and I think we work well together in the working group, and that's not just because we're both jolly nice people and professionals, I mean that hopefully plays a part of it, but essentially it's because the open group itself is an ecosystems nurturing unit, right? And it has done that over time. It brings together different people from different organizations, which- It is an ecosystem in itself. It is an ecosystem in itself. And it, it fosters those kind of behaviors and characteristics. Um, and um, that only became even more obvious to me when I looked at the lens through the ecosystem's lens about how it did that, how it did it successfully. One of the challenges, and you know, with anything, as it becomes more successful and has more interest areas, is scale. There are more headfuls of information going on through the open group and standards. And, you know, I, I've been around far too long uh, in it, to be fair, but, you know, and, and this is always the way, but you see common problems in common for, across forums, and you see in, within work groups, and the same person, the same headful, is forgetting or isn't present to solve the problem. So how you utilize that shared knowledge, how you learn what and pick up what happened has already been solved over here so you can stand on the shoulders of the giants in that forum so that the, I'm gonna pluck it out there, the OSDU can learn something from what the, open, the architecture forum did years ago or the security forum, whatever it is. Um, 
there is a natural opportunity that says AI has got a part to play in that, the AI tooling part is part of it. So there's actually an internal help as well as a kind of part of it, which so it's a kind of double treble win if that's the way you like it. Right. right. Interesting. So, do you want to so the, the Wednesday morning session is really about how are we doing it for real? What, what are you doing with regards to how are you applying the technology to this? What have you done? Come and show us where you are. Um, so it's about tricks and tips and real world stuff. We've got demos. We've got um, some invited experts who are going to uh, come and visit. It's about real stuff that we're actually doing. And there's some, some, there's some stuff that we want to show you that we're particularly proud of. So uh, th as many as possible. And um, biscuits will be served at the back table. <laughs> The, the, the main purpose of the workshop is if you have read the book a few times, hopefully, and you're still having trouble connecting some dots uh, of how it maps to your own uh, professional practice, your day-to-day -day work, we're hoping to give you the taste of blood yeah. of what the future would hopefully look like. There's lots of hands-on stuff, and what we're hoping to do is for you to then go back and think about how it all may change the day-to-day -day work for yourself. And then actually come back and please tell us, because we're going to go write a second book about it now. Yeah, well said. Yeah, and even if you haven't read the book, they'll st you'll still be very welcome, because um, um, your, your thoughts will help evolve what, what happens next in this, in this space. So, um, uh, so we're going to leave it there. We're running about five minutes uh, early or so, but I'm going to do some um, reminders of, um, of sponsors and things. But we'll leave it there for now. Um, thank you, gentlemen, so far for what you've done. Um, and, uh, and obviously, all the members of the, uh, of the work group as well. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a great read. Um, I can recommend it myself. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, it quite rightly got a lot of attention outside as well. Um, and uh, you know, LinkedIn postings and things like that, comments, and people getting quite excited writing book reviews before the book was even out, um, that kind of thing. It's been great. Um, so uh, I look forward to uh, uh, more work in this area and to uh, working with you and getting your inputs on where we go with professional practice, tradecraft, whatever we decide to call it. So. Uh, um, the, all, these three gentlemen, plus some of our speakers uh, from the rest of the day, are all going to be on a panel session this afternoon. So um, one thing I didn't say this morning, because I knew we wouldn't have time for questions, um, and I'm sure there are many, is um, questions here at, the, uh, at this, this event. Um, please go to slido.com and enter the, uh, look for the meeting. Uh, it's hashtag OGEDI. Um, go in there, and that's where the question, please submit questions there, and we will get to as many of them as we can in the panel session um, this afternoon. Um, so, yes, uh, slido.com, you don't need to download anything. As some of you have used this before. Any, any connected device will get you there. Slido.com, and the meeting uh, name is OGEDI. Um, so we'll... Uh, Hopefully have lots for you to answer this afternoon as well um, as, as Wednesday morning. But for now, thank you very much for, to Rahul, Phil Tetlow, and Paul Homan. Thank you, gents. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you.